Darshini David is an economist, broadcaster, writer, speaker, advisor, and self-confessed nerd. She's reported and presented for flagship UK TV and radio news programmes. And she's advised international investment banks, the UK government, and the supermarket chain Tesco. Her best-selling book, The Almighty Dollar, cuts through the jargon to make sense of the economic foundations that underpin the modern world. Here she talks to me about her fears for her reputation and using what makes her different to her advantage. Darshini, thanks for speaking to me. Max, thanks for having me. It's very exciting to be here. Um, you're known as an economist, you're known as a journalist. Um, you do many different things, but how would you describe your profession? I always sort of say it's the nerd's version of the actress model whatever, really. Um, and I'm a portfolio career person, but I'm not a millennial at the same time. So, yeah, I started out be being an economist. I always wanted to be an economist. Uh, I accidentally fell into broadcasting. Um, so uh, when people thought, how did you get that career in broadcasting? I was just sort of literally one day pitched up at the wrong place and they put me on air. What, they interviewed you as an analyst and economist? Absolutely. I used to sit on, on sofas and behind desks and do the yeah. pundit thing. And then uh, stupidly one day the BBC said to me, do you want to come and do this full time? We can teach you about that broadcasting stuff. We just need someone who can explain what it means. Um, and the whole challenge of making that kind of dry, abstract and it's stuff that they, they all sort of a bit high five. It's like, yeah, we have to do this. We have to cover it. Nobody gets it and it doesn't matter. Uh, that really appealed to me. So I went off and became a broadcaster. Um, and then, uh, then I sort of really faced my fears a couple of years ago uh, and decided I was going to do that thing which I've always said I was going to do and write a book as well. Um, which, as, as you know, Max, is a wholly different discipline trying to sit down and write 80,000 words when, frankly, we're used to the world of instant gratification, mm. aren't we? We're breaking news, rolling news. Uh, you do a story the next day, you move on. You might write something that's 600 words long. But the idea of having to research and sit down and write 80,000 words and then almost deliver that baby to the world and have the world judge you on it it's absolutely petrifying. You've known that you, you've been there. Yeah, I mean, because we. It's odd though, because we go on air, mm. and we speak with you know very little preparation quite often, and that's very exposing. Why do we feel so exposed when we have a book which is much more thought out and planned? It's very strange, isn't it? Um, I would say I prefer live broadcasting because it's over in the moment. But then, of course, it does hang around. We just don't think like that, do we? And that people might be analysing our words. Uh, but I think you feel that when it's there, written down in print, uh, there's no hiding from it. It's there. And, uh, you know, people far away from you can be reading this stuff and sitting there either going, oh, she knows nothing about this or this doesn't make sense or whatever um, but actually I always liken the process of writing a book um, to having a baby because it takes forever uh, it feels incredibly painful and you think I'm never doing this again and your first thought after it's out there and you get the first really good review is I'm going to do the next one um, but uh, yeah it's very strange um, where does that fear come from though. So you're absolutely qualified to do what you do, actually more qualified than most business journalists, because you've actually been an economist and you're, you're a trained economist. A lot of people in business journalism uh, are journalists who end up, up in that special because they're interested in it. So why would you have a concern that people might think you don't know what you're talking about? It's weird, isn't it? Um, it's not weird at all. I mean, I think a lot of people f uh, feel this, but, uh, you know, I, I went to uh, a wonderful school, um, you know, one of those schools where they teach you that girls can do anything they set their mind to, and they certainly um, educated me very well, and I went off and, and had a great time uh, at Cambridge and did economics there. So, you know, on paper, it's like, yeah, you know, you can go out there, you can do everything. But then I entered the real world, and I realised, first of all, as an economist, I didn't really look like most of those trading floor economists out there. In fact, a lot of a lot of clients would turn up and look at me and go, Are "You actually, how long have you been doing this?" Um, and then when I went off and became a, a financial journalist, and was sitting there sort of taking CEOs and others to account, quite often you'd get people coming in and going. Um, I remember one one CEO said to me, "So did, did your colleague write you a nice list of questions to ask me?" And you know, it gradually twig over time that yeah, you know, people don't expect financial journalists, perhaps, or economists, uh, to be kind of come in the packaging, which is a 40-something a mother of two, non-white woman who's uh, only five foot two as well. So, you know, I tick all those boxes. I'm not looking like your stereotypical economist or old journalist. But I've seen you in those situations, and what's interesting is you really rise to it. Actually, you become much stronger in that situation. So what's going on 
in your mind? I think it's that, um, you know, I'll, my dad will tell you, I'm, I'm one of those people who likes to have the last word in an argument. And I think it's about proving people wrong and subverting those expectations. And, uh, um, you know, I still remember um, 2010 general election campaign. I was on the road with David Cameron for five weeks. And I still remember um, one of the, one, someone who went on to become a cabinet minister uh, assuming that I must be one of the um, staff at, at a press conference um, and not a journalist because he didn't think journalists looked like me. Um, so when I sat down and thought, right, this means I'm going to have to ask a question and then put up my hand and asked a question about austerity, which got us uh, the lead story that night, I, I just felt like, yeah, see, you underestimated <laughs> me. It's almost like a challenge and shaking me out of my comfort zone. But do you think that's more to do with hope or fear? Um, I think it's a bit of both. It's partly hope, it's partly fear, because there's this fear that, yeah, I'm putting my hand up and asking this question. It goes back to what I was saying before. People are going to ask, look at you and go, that's a stupid question. <laughs> you know? um, but uh, I think people, th there is a real advantage sometimes to being underestimated. And I think that also gives you a license. And, you know, I've, I've spent my life, even though I said, you know, I went to a wonderful school and the rest of it, and I'm very lucky. Um, but I was very conscious of being different. And it took me a while. Um, and at school, you felt like that? Uh, well, at school. I mean, I grew up in the 80s and 90s, so of course. Um, but it took me a while. I think this is true, really, of, of you know, most kids as well, um, that you've got to embrace your difference and make it work for you. And sometimes that means you can bring a fresh angle to things. that other people, however impressive, however confident they may look, might not be able to see or do. So take me through a sort of scenario where you're meeting, you know, a man in his 60s who is chief executive of a big multinational and you walk into the room and he's clearly not taking you seriously. How do you feel and how do you react? Um, I know there was, there was one situation uh, a few years ago where uh, I was actually on a day off and I got this phone call and the call was... Uh, the CEO, the chairman, in fact, he was, uh, still is, um, who we've been chasing forever on a very big story, uh, has just agreed to give us the first interview on this. But he says he'll only do it if it's you. And I thought about this, and I thought, this is very strange. I don't have a relationship with him, um, in the sense that he's not a contact and we don't really know each other. And I realised that the other two options for him would have been my male colleagues. So I thought, ah, oh, he obviously thinks I'm the soft option here, and I'm going to pick him up on anything. Um, so, you know, as I was rushing off to this interview and I remember sitting in the back of this cab, tearing through his accounts and tearing through various papers and then suddenly found a hole uh, in the accounts where, you know, he'd made an excuse saying we can't do blah, blah, blah because we're making a loss on this asset and it's a terrible mess. Um, and it wasn't true at all. It was an accounting trick. Uh, so to go in there and be able to go, right, you said this and hear him rant on and go, yeah, but what about this? And by the end of the interview... He wouldn't talk. He would, you know, when we walked out of the room, you know how unusual this is. He would not say goodbye, shake my hand or anything. And again, that story got from being one of these kind of niche business stories into, right, OK, we're going to clear some space at the top of the bulletin. We're going to put that in because that is that's a breaking line. Uh, it was very satisfying. Um, you know, it was also very gratifying the next time I met him. Uh, a, he remembered me and B, he said, well, you did change the way I think. Brilliant, excellent. <laughs> uh, but are you able to use that to your advantage then? Because once you've figured that out, mm -hmm. you can actually, you know, he's going to be less concerned about being interviewed by you initially. Yes. And then he's softer to begin with and he's easier to break down. Well, you know what it's like, Max, as a journalist? Um, contacts are a funny thing um, in the sense that they've got to be, it's not just a case of being familiar with you. They have to trust that whatever they're telling you, you're going to understand the implications of it and know how to handle it as a story and be responsible with it and I think once you kind of grow your credibility um, it's much easier to do that and that's just one way of doing it it's an unusual way mm. uh, but it is one way of doing it um, a lot of people would be put off by your experiences and would be will feel sort of pushed back by it what is it within you that sort of fires you up when you're faced in a, with a situation like that and you're allowed to push through, you allow yourself to push through and therefore succeed? Um, I think it is the fear of walking out of there thinking, I didn't do my best to, to turn this on its head. Um, and uh, also, you know, I've got kids, I've got daughters, and I don't like the idea that I can't turn around and say to them, sorry, I just didn't, couldn't do it. And ultimately, you know what it's like, Max, you're a parent as well. Uh, at the end of the day, you sit there and go, I've got to pay the bills for the kids. 
And that, more than anything else, is a try. It really does focus the mind as well. So financial security is part of this financial as well. Financial security absolutely is part of it as well. But it, it's also reputational as well. And, um, you know, I found for me a huge change that I wasn't really prepared for was when I had kids. I got to that point in life going, yeah, anything's achievable. And then suddenly, because we were one of the first in our circle to have kids, you're left with this bundle of something. And mine arrived early as well. So I had this bundle of whatever that I didn't know what to do with. Um, and then this idea of, right, now I'm going to have to think about what this means for my career. And there were certain perceptions that, you know, I was going to perhaps take a, take a back step here and just um, ease off a bit and the rest of it. And I thought... No, I'm going to write a book. I'm going to write a book, yes. <laughs> no, I'm just going to go up even earlier in the morning. Um, but, but it is partly perception, and I think it is also partly um, having the support to do those kind of things as well. Uh, and ultimately, as I say, it's proving people wrong. I, I know a lot of people who assumed, after I started having kids, that I think this is true for a lot of women, um, that, oh, now you want to kind of ease off a bit. And, uh, you know, there was one colleague who, every time I walked in the office, would say to me, oh, you know, how are you kids? Um, great, um, great. But can we can we move past this? And I still remember going back to my first um, appraisal after I'd had children and gone back to work, and I'd gone in and I was really excited about talking about you know developing and moving up to the next stage. And the manager who I was doing it with sat down. And he said, "Yeah, yeah, forget all that. The thing that really fascinates you about people like you, how do you manage your childcare?" And I was like, oh, "Gosh, why bother?" And actually, I think that made me more determined to prove him wrong. More than anything else. So is your fear associated with your reputation or is it how you feel or what, how do you describe your fear? I think it's a combination of things. I think reputation is a big part of it. I know as broadcasters we don't like to admit that we have egos of any sort whatsoever. Uh, but I think there is a degree of that. I think it is reputational in that sense. Also, um, as you say, you know, I, I, I try to carve out my niche as being a financial journalist who knew what I was talking about. And in a way, I think that almost means the stakes are higher if you get something wrong. Um, and also, I hate to say this, but uh, I am a Virgo, and I think there is something in that, about being a perfectionist, <laughs> and frankly, about being a bit of a pain in the bottom as well at times. Uh, you talked about having your kids and how that was a big moment for you. Uh, did you have to really sort of deal with your hopes and fears at that point? Was that a big challenge for you? Was that a big moment for you? Um, professionally? Professionally, yes. I think... Uh, in a way, I had my first child in America, in actual fact, um, on the eve of the financial crisis. In fact, I went straight from the studio and talking about um, the implications of Northern Rock collapsing and the rest of it uh, to the hospital. Um, and uh, I'm not sure I'd ever advise that, by the way, as a, <laughs> as a way to have a child. But um, so, you know, I, I sort of went into it thinking, wow, this is all happening. And yes, I've got this baby. And I remember going, still remember going back during maternity leave with the baby in a car seat one night. Uh, into the studio and my editor basically keeping an eye on her while I stood in front of the camera to do something. I can't remember exactly. Has it been Lehman's or before that? I can't remember now. Uh, a long time ago. Um, but I think it was after that that it started hitting me that um, things were going to change. And some of those changes were within my control and some weren't. Um, and the things that were outside of my control, it goes back to what we were talking about, about trying to prove people wrong. Uh, were the things that I found frustrating when I had bosses saying to me, I oh, know you want to do this instead. And I'm going, no, I don't. I, I want to do this. And how do I get there? Um, and it may always, not always be the conventional path. What have you learned then that other people can sort of benefit from in terms of, uh, you know, breaking through some of the personal barriers to get to where you are now? Mm. Um, I think, you know, just to focus back in on, on you know, the whole idea of how your life changes and, and how everything changes when you become a mother, for example. And uh, one of the things, um, Carolyn Fairburn, who's the head of the CBI, you know, the bosses organisation here in the UK, um, has talked about the fact that a business is not set up for women in the sense that a lot of networking things happen in the evening. Um, and that for, I mean, it's, it's the same for parents, equally for dads as well, that that just generally doesn't work. Um, and I was trying to emphasise there is another way. Um, you know, just to give you a couple of examples. Uh, I got an interview, an exclusive interview, with the CEO of a FTSE 100 company who hadn't talked on camera for 15 years. And this happened because of a friend I made at the school gates who worked with him. 
who just said to me, she said, you know what, I think you two get on really well. He's an economist too. Um, do you mind just shoving me a copy of your CV and I'll see if he wants to have a coffee with you. And things went on from there. Um, so th that's one example. Another one is that, you know, when I... Um, when I worked at Sky, and we were having a big push to get more female guests on, and I sat down with the editor of this programme and I went, tell me, what is our problem? And he went, oh, there's only a few big FTSE CEOs who are women. Um, and, uh, yeah, we tried one the other day, but she had childcare issues, so, you know, that's how women are nowadays. And I said to him, no, it's not, and I rang her up. And I said to her, so has anyone ever offered you a pre-recorded interview opportunity? She said, no, they just told me I could come on live. And I said, well, come on over at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. We'll do this, if you have to do the school run. And afterwards, I said to the editor, I said, you do realise there are probably blokes who have to do the school run as well, but they'll make a different excuse. And so I think, you know, really, frankly, there isn't just one way to do things. There's a number of different routes. And I think you've got to remember you are bringing something different to the table. And just keep hanging on to that. It's so intimidating for a lot of people. What you do, though, you go on air, you've got this incredible education, and you're very knowledgeable. Uh, you're obviously very smart, but it's not necessarily that that's been the root of your success, is it? It's the fact that you're so determined as well and ambitious, or what is it? Yeah, um, I think so. I think that, and, and um, you have to be versatile and dynamic, I think, as well. With And when I say dynamic, I don't mean the sense that, wow, you've got to be the superwoman. And incidentally, I don't think this whole superwoman thing has done anybody any favours, particularly women, because uh, it's wholly unrealistic. Um, you know, whenever you see the city superwoman with 15 kids and um, the rest of it, there's going to be a, a load of help at home uh, and people have got to be more honest about that. Um, but I think it is determination. I think it's taking, uh, accepting, I mean, and this is true for everybody, accepting that nothing is forever, that you will make the wrong choices sometimes. And in a way, it's what you make out of them um, that matters. And that sometimes the opportunities that look completely left field are the ones further down the line um, are the ones you look back on and go actually that, that's what gave me that valuable push What about the very successful people that you've worked with, you've interviewed have you ever noticed uh, something they have in common? Um, you know there's the easy thing that, that I was at a talk recently um, with uh, you know, a, a senior sort of figure in education who said that when it comes to teenagers you know, you've always got to remember grit is not inherited and I think, you know, this goes back to climatology. Um, and it is one of those things that you really do have to focus on the study. Um, resilience is a big part of it. Uh, vision, but, you know, not, not many people have a five-year plan. And as I'm saying, I think sometimes if you are too inflexible about what your goals are and things don't work out like that, um, you can ultimately get much more stuff than otherwise if you'd had a much more kind of I think growth mindset is what they call it isn't it now <laughs> as a trendy term <laughs> um, but would you agree with me that a lot of the most successful people are the most insecure oh definitely definitely um, I think you know you and I have both interviewed and worked with enough people to know that sometimes the ones who you know you then go wow um, when you see them behind the scenes and, and little glimpses of what else goes on, they are the most insecure, and it's because they constantly feel they have something to prove what mm. drives them. But off camera, they can be quite nervous, can't they? And then they get on camera and they're okay. Um, why do you think they, they put themselves through it? Um, I, th I think, uh, you know, everybody's motivation is different, isn't it? Um, but I think it is to prove something to someone somewhere. And I think that's true of all of us, isn't it? I mean, why else do we do it? Um, but I think it's uh, one of those things you've got to remember that everyone has their own thing. I mean, I hate public speaking. Uh, I, but you do it all the time. No, no, we don't, though, do we? Well, you, well, we you, talk to cameras. You've done it with your book. I, yes, I do do it in my book. Uh, but again, that's something I've had to work on. And when I look back and go, why on earth do I, do, um, you know, I'm going to go off and do that a bit later, and why on earth am I pushing myself to do this? Um, it's almost to kind of prove myself wrong and go, no, I can overcome that. I can, you know, mm. I, I've done all sorts of things. When I look back, I haven't had the career I set out to have by any means. And there's some parts of it I go, gosh, that's a mess. And the other parts I look back, I go, wow, you know, I managed to do that. I was never big into acting or anything like that at school. So how I've ended up in broadcasting, I don't know. <laughs> because, you know, broadcasting is, is basically 90% acting, isn't it, really? Well, I wonder, you've got to be yourself, haven't you? And that's, yeah. what, that's where it becomes you feel vulnerable because yeah. an actor can hide behind a mask whereas we can't I feel sometimes feel that can be more worrying it can be can't it? although you've got to have that sense of theatre with it and you've got to be comfortable kind mm. of laying that on top haven't you of who you are almost exaggerating who you are 
which can be quite a strange feeling, but it's like adopting a persona, though, really. I mean, that's how I think a good one anyway. <laughs> um, when I was talking about fear and its role in success, one exec said to me, does that mean I have to instill fear in my children to make them do well? Um, do you think it's possible to be successful if you're very happy with your lot and actually <laughs> don't feel particularly <laughs> driven? Do you still fear into your kids, Max? <laughs> well, no, but I, I think my thinking on that, my answer to him was, you know, you've got this very lavish lifestyle. Perhaps their fear will be not having that for their kids. It's not necessarily... I don't actually see fear as a bad thing. I mm -hmm. think fear is actually can be a huge advantage and you can turn it around to your advantage as well. I mean, I think, uh, I, I think fear, when I look back at my own childhood, I think fear in the good sense um, was definitely played a huge role. Um, you know, our parents were hugely kind of focus on education and making sure that we had the best start in life um, and I'm very grateful for that and um, you know failure was not an option um, not, not in the sense that you'd be locked in the cupboard under the stairs or anything but it just wasn't an option uh, and I do worry when I look at my kids or kids nowadays and I think you know we and I'm a school governor as well and you know it's great that we nurture kids much more perhaps than when we were growing up and that we think much more about their emotional and mental well-being um, but at the same time, sometimes I think feel, almost feel like we're giving them this too cosy. It's okay. It's fine. You know, just relax. It'll all, everything is going to be okay. Are we preparing them for the way the world actually is? I'm not so sure because, frankly, I'm not really sure. I'd want to graduate right now and go into the world of work because it is absolutely cutthroat. Um, so if you're launching yourself into a world mm. like that, perhaps fear may not be a bad thing. But you were talking about how um, failing isn't all bad in your in your world. Actually, yeah. you found you've learned quite a lot from it. But mm. at what point did you discover that? Was that later in life, or has that I'm always been with you? I'm still discovering that. Definitely still discovering that um, because I think. No one, says, no one deliberately goes into something going, I'm going to fail at this, do they? It's sometimes the things you think are going to have the most opportunity, the most promise. The job you go, wow, this is going to be amazing. And then you get there and you go, this isn't what it was cracked up to be. And I hate this place and, and the people and whatever. And this isn't tallying with what I want out of life. Um, and it, it's sometimes having to write, chalk, almost chalk it up to experience and go, what am I going to make of this? So I wouldn't say there's ever been a point from which I've gone, OK, fine, you know, I, I, I know that failure is going to have to be part of this journey and I'm going to go looking for failure. Um, but I do feel the older I get now, and, I, you know, when I go and talk to schools and things like this, I always try and say to kids who are agonising about A-levels or degrees and what careers they're going to do, you can change your mind. You can change your mind and the unexpected things mm -hmm. are going to happen. And the important thing, it's like being a presenter, isn't it, Max? I mean... You, you don't earn your money for, frankly, reading things off an auto queue. You read your money for the fact that you can keep things going and make something out of it when things are going, you know, completely wrong behind the scenes. Uh, and it's the same with life, really. I think, you know, there's, there's a lot of parallels. Uh, just a question on your choices in terms of career. You are a news presenter as well as a economics correspondent and writer and author. Um, why did you stick with the specialism? What did you learn about news reading that made you always stick with your specialism? That's uh, yeah, that's an uh, um, interesting question. I mean, I, uh, you know, I, I sound like someone who keeps falling into careers by accident, but I did fall into general news presenting um, by accident as well because um, I did a, a successful stint on a business program and the audience figures went up uh, quite sharply, and I got called in by the bosses of the organisation I worked with and it was like great you know we're, we're going to give you the opportunity to go off and become a general news anchor and that's seen as a step up from business journalism uh, you know business journalism is that bit in the corner which no one really wants to know to read or, or do um, and I've got to say you know I enjoyed the challenge of that because that is a wholly different way of thinking as you well know um, and it's fantastic but A I miss the comfort of the niche and I think some of the best advice I was given was have a niche have something that sets you out. There are any number of people out there who are very good general news anchors. Um, but when it comes to, you know, budget day and Philip Hammond pulls something out or, or Trump stands up and, and um, reels off a new list of tariffs or, or, you know, China comes out with its new five-year plan, uh, not everyone can pull that one apart and go, yep, this is what it means and this is what we should be worried about and this is actually something that's been said before and didn't mean a thing. Uh, and I think if you've got that niche in life, it's one of those things that holds you in, in good stead. And, um, you know, to be honest, when it comes to writing a book, I felt that I did have a niche because, A, I did have this background in economics, but 
unlike most people, I was keen to make it accessible. So I wrote a book about the global economy. It follows one dollar around the world, um, from America to China and Nigeria and Russia and all over the place. Uh, but the idea was just to explain those terms you might hear on the news every day and go, what's it got to do with me? And also explain how we've got to this stage now where 10 years after the financial crisis, a lot of people's incomes haven't budged. And generally, there's this feeling that life isn't fair and that all this money's been pumped out everywhere, but we're not seeing much of it. Why is that and what can you do about it? And the book's done incredibly well, much better than anyone expected, <laughs> dare I say. Not me, but, you know, it's, it's done much better than you'd expect it, right? It's, and it's, it's selling around the world. Mm. Do you feel then that you've succeeded now and you can relax? Uh, of course I can't relax, no. Um, when then, will you have succeeded? Whenever I'm allowed to retire. No, I, I'm joking. When will I uh, succeed? Do you know, I, the thing I love about having written the book is going around and speaking to people and doing events. And I've been off doing literature festivals. I've been off giving lectures at universities and um, speaking to community groups and schools. And what is brilliant, and this is what I've always loved about being a financial broadcaster as well. I think the biggest compliment you can be given is you made that all sound so clear. I can understand it now. And that, to me, is the big thing. Someone goes, I know no idea about this, but this is really exciting. One of the things, by the way, I really like about the way my book is selling is that it's selling particularly well at airports. So clearly there's a lot of people out there who want to take it on the beach, which really, <laughs> really intrigues me. Well, it's building over time as well, isn't it? So that's really encouraging that once people are reading it, mm. Uh, it's doing well and they're obviously recommending it. It's not just down to marketing. It, well, yeah, I mean, this has been the fascinating thing about writing a book is that a lot of it is word of mouth. Um, and, you know, I, I've been really lucky because, you know, the release in the UK meant that I've been to all corners of the country, uh, met people I never otherwise would have met and, and had all sorts of interesting discussions. Um, but I think, you know, that, that's the thing about, about writing a book is that it makes you realise as well what's on people's minds. And you can feed into that. Um, you, don't know how, you don't need to tell me what it is, but is, is there an ambition you're still hoping to achieve or are you just going to see how things go? Uh, is there an ambition? Um, do you know what? I'm in quite an unusual position right now because I have, um, as I said, I'm, I'm doing this very much portfolio role. I've been very lucky. I've been back in the city um, advising an investment bank on the economy. I've been um, working with a financial regulator on consumer finances. I'm off broadcasting and, and doing some presenting work there. And I've got the book as well. So in that sense, you know, I'm very much in this very privileged position, I feel, where I'm getting fresh insights. I'm learning new stuff, which at my stage in my career is quite unusual. Um, I think I've got more to do, definitely. And, you know, the more I see of what's going on in the world, there's definitely more to be done with debunking financial broadcasting. So, you know, it's something I'm really particularly enjoying what getting my teeth to. And going back to, you know, one of the things I'm proudest of recently is I did a piece on London Fashion Week and um, everyone said it couldn't be done as a serious story. And, yeah, fair enough, it had Alexa Chung in it. Uh, but we did it as a way of looking at, at Brexit. But, you know, the thing I managed to break through doing that story was the fact that Chanel was... Um, relocating its global headquarters to London. Uh, and the reaction to that really fascinated me because for some people it was a case of, it's not a car maker, it doesn't employ that many people, it's not serious business. And that to me was old fashioned business and I got a huge reaction from it. And when we looked at why, Chanel's the biggest luxury brand on the planet, it has 13 million Instagram followers. So for them it was huge news and I just thought again, this is a way of doing financial news differently and actually kind of cutting through to a whole different audience. So I think there's much more to, to be done there, and I'm, I'm really looking Well, congratulations with all of it, and particularly the book, Whatever Comes Next. Whatever Comes Next. Thanks, Darshini. Thank you, Max.